He's back! Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Pro Talk Wrestling here, of course, as part of the Game Changing Network. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Nate the Effing Great, listening to this live here on Spreaker.com. Thank you so much for joining me here. Also, this is going to be available on iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, as well as on SoundCloud as soon as this finishes up. It's going to be an absolutely awesome show, you guys, so let's not waste any time. Let's get talking about this week of wrestling, because it was quite eventful, to say the least. And of course, the big news that came out of this week is that Roman Reigns returned to Monday Night Raw to make a huge announcement, and what announcement it was. He made the announcement that he has buried leukemia once again. He has defeated it. He is in remission. He is back, ladies and gentlemen. And for those of you that say that he was faking it and that this is all for a storyline and blah, 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 a few things. One, we don't need to know everything about his public records as well as his health. Two, he looked like he definitely lost a bit of weight. He definitely did not seem as muscular as he did before. And three, yeah, for those of you that think that was a fake and that was a work, you can just go F off. That's all I got to say about that. It was great to see Roman Reigns back on Raw again. It was great to see him looking healthy and looking just really good. And honestly, that one fan that said, you suck, obviously the rest of the crowd did not want to get that guy the pleasure of having that moment. So they chanted, Roman, Roman, Roman. He had a great reaction when he came back. And he even did a spear to Drew Galloway after his match with Dean Ambrose. Roman Reigns is looking to be back on top. He looks to show that he is indeed the big dog. It's not just his yard anymore. It's our yard, ladies and gentlemen. It's really great to see Roman Reigns back. It was one of those things that I really, really loved about Raw. It was a great way to kick off Raw, and it definitely set the pace for Raw. Really good to see him back. Roman, great job on kicking leukemia's ass, and we look forward to seeing you back in the ring sooner rather than later. Also, what happened on Monday Night Raw, guys, we got a little bit more of the uh, Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey storyline. Uh, Ronda and Natty were involved with a match with the Riot Squad. Becky Lynch would get involved attacking Natalia as well as the Riot Squad and then going after Ronda Rousey. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, what ended up happening was that, oh boy, that Becky Lynch got arrested. She got warned that if she pulled the stunt like she did at Fastlane, at uh, Elimination Chamber again, she would be arrested. And we got that. We got that. Ronda Rousey basically went on the microphone stating, hey, reinstate Becky, reinstate Becky, reinstate Becky. Stephanie came out and she said, well, you know that she's going to jail. There's nothing really that we can do about this. And, of course, Becky Lynch is saying, no, Ronda Rousey, I should say, she's say, saying, no, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. You definitely do deserve... She deserves this shot. She earned this shot. She definitely deserves to face me at WrestleMania. And here's where it gets to be very interesting because she pulls a bit of a John Cena-like feel. Uh, if you remember back in 2011, uh, CM Punk got suspended. Basically, speaking the whole infamous pipe bomb deal, and he got suspended all the way until his contract expired. John Cena said, you need to reinstate him because we need to have this matchup. And Vince was just saying... No, I can't do that. I can't do that. And John Cena said, well, if I can't defend this title against somebody who's earned the shot at me, and if I can't defend this title against CM Punk, then this title means absolutely nothing. And that is basically what Ronda Rousey said. Now, obviously, it was in a little more of a less convicting kind of way, but it was still enough to leave that impact on that it felt like CM Punk and John Cena, in fact, Ronda Rousey left the women's title in the middle of the ring, walked out on Stephanie, and Stephanie was just kind of staying there. She didn't do like what her old man did. She didn't run after her with the belt and say, hey, you got your match, which would have been awesome. Nope, she just kind of stood there. She was just in shock. She looked down at the belt. We got a little deal in which we saw her holding onto the belt. It's kind of one of those things where, I don't know, she, she kind of looks like... She got a victory out of this, but at the same time, she's just like, I, I don't know how I how I feel about this, because this was not exactly what was supposed to happen. 
Uh, Charlotte had a really great response on SmackDown this week, where basically she says, says, well, Becky and Ronda are basically hiding the fact that they can't handle the Queen, that they can't handle the fact of defeating the Queen. And this upcoming Monday, she's actually going to be on Raw to basically think that she's going to be awarded the Raw Women's title by Vince McMahon. So this is going to be a very interesting situation because you have this whole ordeal in which you have Becky Lynch, you know, arrested. You have Becky Lynch uh, basically in jail, quote-unquote. Uh, if you haven't seen those mug shots of hers, damn. I mean, just, just damn. She looks good. <laughs> um, and you also have Ronda Rousey kind of quitting. Well, not necessarily quitting. She didn't say the phrase, I quit. She just kind of walked out, and it's kind of one of those things where you're not really sure what's going on. Uh, I'm kind of hoping what this does is it does kind of show that, you know, what Vince is doing is not exactly right. Uh, there were people that were chanting triple threat, triple threat during the Ronda Rousey uh, promo, which some people really want. I'm not one of those people. I kind of want it to be between Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey. And, uh, well, that might not exactly be the case. Because if you've seen Twitter, you definitely know that Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch have definitely been at each other like crazy. And Ronda, oh boy, Ronda kind of took it a step maybe too far. Uh, Becky Lynch made a comment to Ronda, and uh, Ronda used the word fake during the tweet. Uh, she even, oh jeez, uh, she had a picture of Becky locking in the uh, disarmor on her and made a comment about, you know, how her arm bar looks fake and how she wishes that it was just, you know, it was like the dick that she wished that she had. I don't know. It was really weird. I mean, I know that Becky is known as the man, but at the same time, it's one of those things where it's like, you don't need a dick reference put into a wrestling deal, especially when it comes to a won't know. Um... It just seems really, really weird. Uh, and to be honest, you guys, one of the things that kind of got me was, uh, okay, Rhonda, you're complaining about her arm bar looking fake. We've been complaining for a while now that your arm bar does not even look that lethal. It just looks like one of those things where it's kind of stretching the arm, but it's not like one of those things where it would be impossible to get out of. No, it looks just, it looks bad. If I compared Ronda's armbar to Becky's armbar, I think I'd be more intimidated by Becky's quote-unquote fake armbar than Ronda Rousey's one. Now, if she went into the UFC type deal, I would be basically saying, "Yeah, um, she's going to tear my arm off. Let's let's not let's not do this." Um, but yeah, I was kind of one of those people that looked at it and was just like, "Okay, so now she's getting personal." And there even was a follow-up tweet that Ronda did, where basically she said. You know, we don't need a ring to do this. We don't need an arena. I will just, you know, beat the ever-living shit out of you. Now, WWE is not very pleased with this because obviously they are PG and they just really don't like it when people say, you know, shit or drop the F-bomb or stuff like that. And I think this could be one of those things where maybe Ronda took it a little too personally. I don't like the fact that she kind of was going off on that. I mean, we understand that WWE and professional wrestling is all scripted, but at the same time, you don't always have to remind us. And if there's a star that's literally saying that, it kind of does take away from from their character as well as their... Uh, uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for? The word I'm looking for. Their uh, credibility. There we go. So I think Ronda is either not pleased with what she's doing right now, or she's just, I don't know, she's taking things maybe too far. That's just my opinion on it. Uh, I really hope that we do get Ronda versus Becky at WrestleMania, and now that there's a part of me that's just like, okay, I really want Becky Lynch to lock in the disarm her on Ronda and make her submit. I want that to happen so badly right now. Now, obviously, they might want to do the triple threat because they want to keep, you know, Becky looking strong, but they also want to make Ronda still look 
undefeated, yada, yada, blah, 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 whatever. It is what it is, but at the same time, it's one of those things where it's like, you don't need to do that. Do that. You could have the one-on-one -on -one deal, and if Ronda's, you know, just going to whine and complain about how she lost, you have to remember, this stuff is all scripted. It's fine. We can get the rematch, and you could probably win it back. It's not a big deal. At least not in my opinion. I, it's just one of those things where when people take things way too personally, it really does kind of take away from the fun that people are trying to have from, from watching wrestling. It really is amazing to see that. I hope that, you know, it's, maybe I'm just overanalyzing it, but it just feels like one of those things where it's like, I think Ronda's a little, little bit too emotional for this, maybe? Hmm. I don't know. And of course, guys, the other big thing that happened this week on Raw, whoo, doggy, we got to see the woo nature boy, Ric Flair's birthday. And of course, a lot of us were speculating, well, what's going to happen during this? Is Becky Lynch going to, you know, come in and just basically rip Ric Flair's arm off? Are we going to see maybe uh, Ronda do something to her, to him? Uh, are we going to see the you know, sort of crazy, crazy? Uh... Never in my wildest dreams was I expecting what happened on Raw. So, here's what happened. They brought out a lot of the legends, such as uh, Shawn Michaels, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. They brought out Sting, which I was ecstatic to see. I always love seeing Sting. And then they introduced Ric Flair. His music plays, but no Rick. And it's kind of like, uh, okay, so, okay, so we're going to get somebody coming out. Or somebody's going to just start beating up on Flair. To my surprise, we got the return of the animal Batista. He grabs a cameraman, just drags him to Ric Flair's locker room, and he basically just yells at the cameraman, you stay right here, you don't move. Opens the door to Ric Flair's locker room, and even slams it. It was one of those things where it's like, holy crap, what the, what the hell? And then we just hear, you know, boom, 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 boom coming in the locker room, and then Batista opens the door, he drags Ric Flair out of the locker room, and then just places him down on the ground, he looks up at the camera, and he goes, hey Hunter, do I have your attention now? Huh? And he gives like this kind of panting, but he also gives like a little evil smirk before just having a stone cold face, Triple H runs to the back to check on Flair, they get and paramedics and blah blah stuff like that guys Batista is back which probably means we're getting Batista versus Triple H at Wrestlemania oh god help us we are going to get this matchup now for those of you that don't know kind of the backstory behind this basically what happened was that Batista came back on the thousandth episode of Smackdown to do a you know evolution deal with Flair, Triple H, and Randy Orton. He goes off on everybody's accomplishments, you know, talks highly of Randy Orton, talks highly of Ric Flair, uh, talks very highly of Triple H. He says, you know, there's nothing that this man hasn't accomplished. And then Batista slides in a, except beat me. So that's kind of where people are thinking, like, the seeds could be sown into this. But this is also one of those situations where you're looking at what's going on here, and there's such potential for this. So, one theory that's been going around is that there has been the idea brought up of having, like, this NXT invasion, or kind of having this kind of power struggle between these members of the family, between Shane and Steph, Triple H and Vince, and all this kind of stuff like there. And it seems like we're now finally getting some of the pieces put together here to possibly set this thing up because you could arguably have Triple H and Stephanie uh, lift the charges against Becky Lynch, bringing her back because they realize that Charlotte and Ronda are not exactly the champions that they want. And Vince kind of screwed over Becky by having Charlotte be the replacement for her at WrestleMania. Uh, and this could be another thing is that Triple H is trying so hard to, you know, you know, do these things, but Vince is like, no, I'm stuck in my ways. I'm going to do what I think is best. And to really make sure that he, you know, has nothing standing in his way, he's got to take out 
the opposition. He's kind of tr- trying to do him like, you know, he's trying to, it's like with the Monday Night Wars. He's trying to find a way to beat Ted Turner. How did he do that? He found ways to destroying him. You know, bringing in the young talent, uh, basically providing better wrestling content and stuff like that. In this case, it's obviously somebody with his, in his family, but it's also somebody that could probably overpower Vince. But what's the best way to you know, take him out is to have somebody do the dirty work for him. And honestly, guys, there is a history between... Uh, there is a history between... Um, Vince and Batista that maybe some people don't remember. Because if you remember back in 2010, uh, Vince actually utilized Batista to beat up on Bret Hart, to take the title off of John Cena. He was kind of like the go-to guy for quite a while. He was kind of like uh, Vince's, you know, bo- you know, body, and I wouldn't say bodyguard, uh, his muscle for a while. And it was kind of a nice match. So this could be a situation where Batista, yeah, he's basically saying that, you know, hey, I could beat Triple H. But, um, <clears throat> but um, you know, he also has goods with Vince McMahon. So that's the storyline that I think could happen here. But it could also be one of those situations where Batista has mentioned before that he only wanted to work for WWE. Uh, some people said that he snubbed off uh, AEW, I'm sure that AEW has tried to, you know, contact him, try to get him under contract, but Batista made it clear. He said, I don't want to wrestle for anybody else other than WWE, and if he was going to retire, he wanted to retire at the hands of Triple H. So, this is a storyline for Batista to come true. It looks like Triple H has made a full recovery from his uh, in- injury at uh, Crown Jewel, the pay-per-view that I hate talking about. And, uh, yeah, it looks like we're going to get Triple H versus Batista at WrestleMania. And this is going to be a really good story because you have to remember, guys, Batista is the only guy, to my knowledge, that has beaten Triple H on three consecutive pay-per-views. I mean, look at the backstory. WrestleMania 21, Batista pins Triple H to become the World Heavyweight Champion. Backlash. Batista pins Triple H again to retain the World Heavyweight title. Then we go to Vengeance, Hell in the Cell, which was honestly... God, that match was brutal. Um, And we saw Triple H, who had this undefeated streak going into Hell in the Cell. He was undefeated in this match. Well, undefeated in singles. But, uh, yeah, he lost to Batista again. He made Batista look like a champ. He made Batista look like a million bucks. And that was something that really needed to happen. And, you know, obviously it carried over into SmackDown. Batista still had to earn it, but he proved to be a worthy world champion. So, thanks to Triple H for that. Now, he's tra- I think he's trying to pay the favor. He's like, you know, hey, you did this for me. I'm going to do this for you. So... I think it's really cool to see this. And plus, you think of the storyline and the the, the the promos that they could do. Like, I would really love it if Batista were to make a comment where it's like, you know, you didn't pay attention to me when I, first, when I left a few years ago. In fact, you basically laughed at me, thinking that I wasn't going to be one of the biggest stars in Hollywood, but look at me now. And there's people that are saying like, oh, we would love to see him come out as Drax during the WrestleMania entrance. It would be... It would be cool to see, but at the same time, it's one of those things where it's like, I'm okay with it being mentioned in promos, but I don't need to see, you know, Drax fully make up, fully get out during a WrestleMania deal. I mean, I already get it. I could see him doing that in a Marvel movie. I don't need to see him as a WrestleMania matches deal. If you were to bring out the Blades from Guardians of the Galaxy, oh, that I'd be okay with. That would be kind of cool. But, you know, for him to come kind of out kind of, even like a deal where he's just, doing, like, you know, a costume or something like that. It just would seem really weird. But, you know, anything that would involve him just coming in with, like, a most badass entrance, you know, doing, like, a a knives thing or looking like a h- action hero, that would be cool. That would be cool with that. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with that come Monday. Holy cow. Just a few days away. That's going to be absolutely insane. All right. So let's start talking a little bit about SmackDown. 
Uh, Kofi Kingston and Daniel Bryan kicked off SmackDown with a contract signing, or we thought was a contract signing, uh, between the two of them for a WWE title match at uh, Fastlane. But Mr. McMahon came out, he gave his proper dues to Kofi, saying, like, hey, you know, you definitely have earned this shot. You have definitely have worked your ass off. You've done a great performer, and yada, 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 yada. But I just don't think that you're the right candidate for this matchup here. And he brings out KO himself, Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens comes out, and they make the match official between Kevin Owens and Daniel Bryan for Fastlane for the WWE Championship. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to why Kofi Kingston was replaced by Kevin Owens. Uh, the one thing being that they want to save the Kofi Kingston versus Daniel Bryan match for WrestleMania. If that is the case, I truly believe that Kofi Kingston will dethrone Daniel Bryan and win the title at WrestleMania. I truly believe that would be the situation they're going. They might even throw a triple threat match in there, throwing in Kevin Owens again. Maybe there's like screwy finish at the end of Fastlane. But I would much rather see it be one on one again. Yeah, I would say I'm going to say this: if they do a one on one match between Kofi and Bryan, that means they're probably going to do the triple threat match at uh, for the Raw Women's Title. If they do a triple threat match for the WWE title, I think it's going to be one-on-one for the Raw Women's title. I don't see them doing two triple threat matches in the same night, because they did something like that back at WrestleMania 20, where they had the uh, Fatal 4-Way matches for the tag team titles, uh, both for Raws and for SmackDowns, but I just don't see any reason for them to do something like that again. Yes, they have enough talent to do it, but it just it just doesn't really make sense for me. Uh, but we also got to see Kevin Owens and Kofi Kingston take on Daniel Bryan and uh, Eric Rowan in the main event of that SmackDown. And Kevin Owens breaking out a stunner to pin Daniel Bryan. So this could mean that Kevin Owens is going to have the stunner as his finisher for the time being. Or for maybe the rest of his career. Who knows? Honestly... I'm okay with that because it's been a long time since somebody has used a stunner as their finisher. Other okay, other than the Mac, but that's that's different. <laughs> the Mac is the Mac, and Kevin Owens is Kevin Owens. I, I'm not helping the case, but anyway, the point is that we may have a new finisher with Kevin Owens for the time being. Uh, Kevin Owens also came out with a new tattoo. He looked a lot slimmer, looked a bit healthier. He definitely looked different than what. We saw uh, when he got injured. So, uh, excuse me. I'm kind of interested in seeing where this goes with Kevin Owens and Daniel Bryan. It's going to be interesting to see what happens at Fastlane. Uh, We also got a triple threat match for the United States Championship. And this was actually probably, yeah, this, this was probably my match of the week, to be fair. Uh, we had our truth come out. He said that he was going to bring back the U.S. Open Challenge. He was going to be just like John Cena, but he was going to do it so much better. And out comes Andrade San Almas to address the challenge. Then out came Rey Mysterio. And basically, Truth just said, you know what? I'm going to basically one-up John Cena. He does one-on-one. I do triple threat. Let's do this. So we got a great matchup from these three individuals. We had our truth Andrade, Rey Mysterio. All three of these men definitely put on quite the show, honestly. It was really cool. You got to see, you know, the athletics ability that Andrade and Ray have. You had the speed that our truth would deliver as well. For a guy his age, he definitely, oh my God. I have a feeling he does DDP yoga because for him to continue to be as athletic as he is, it's just absolutely fantastic seeing how he works. Uh, in the end, though, we would see uh, Rey Mysterio roll up, get rolled up by uh, our truth Our truth would retain the U.S. title, and it looks like our truth is going to continue to do the U.S. Open Challenge going into this upcoming week's SmackDown. So, god dang, we're going to be getting our truth U.S. Open Challenge for quite a while. Uh, I like this. I really do. I like the fact that our truth is the U.S. champion. It's one, of, and it's actually a more memorable run than his uh, first run with the title. He 
won it off the Miz, and the following week they did a four-way match where the Miz won it back. Uh, this time around, it's been very interesting, but also very cool to see. Because this is a guy who definitely has busted his ass for so long, he's finally getting the comeuppance that he deserves. Uh, I would have loved to see him held the WWE title once, but obviously that is probably a little, a little too late for that. So having him as the U.S. champion is really good. It brings a little more prestige to the title, and I think he's going to be a great champion, in my honest opinion. Uh, also on SmackDown, we got the return of Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy made his return, teaming with Jeff Hardy to take on the bar. And, yeah, this is a pretty stellar matchup. You know the history between the bar and the Hardy boys go back as far as when the Hardys first returned uh, to the WWE back at WrestleMania 33? Yep, 33. Um, yeah, it was really cool to see them uh, back together again, and Matt Hardy is not exactly uh, doing the uh, woken, broken gimmick anymore. In fact, if you go on to uh, his YouTube page, he actually addresses that. He addresses, you know, the fact that he's kind of contained himself. He's kind of taken all of these uh, gimmicks that he's done in the past. He even addresses a lot of them from the past. I think he calls it like he's a, a multi cert multi-surfaced, I believe it was, some, something along those lines, where he basically said, you know, if it calls for, you know, me to bring out my woken, broken brilliance, I'll do that. If it calls for me being Matt Hardy V1 now and bringing out the Mattitude, I will do that. If it calls for a little Team Extreme, I will do that too. If it calls for, you know, this Matt Hardy, this Matt Hardy. It was really cool to see that. It's a brief, like, two, three-minute video, I believe it is. But it's worth the watch. It's really cool to see that because Matt Hardy addresses his gimmicks, he says that, you know, he'll break them out when he needs to. So we're not saying goodbye to Woken Matt Hardy or V1 Matt Hardy or any of those Matt Hardys yet. He still looks to uh, be Matt Hardy and just be absolutely wonderful. And he even addresses uh, the deal going on with the tag team titles. He said, you know, no matter who wins, whether it's uh, Miz and Shane or the Usos, we're coming for those tag team titles. And I just had the... <laughs> The vision of Matt Hardy and Jeff Hardy versus the Usos at WrestleMania. Oh, God help us. Give us that matchup, please. I would be a very thankful man. Thank you very much. I am looking forward to that being a possible reality. And if they add a gimmick to it, that's fine. If they don't, then hey, that's also fine. I'm okay with that. So we're going to be looking to see... What goes on on the highway to WrestleMania? We've just exited on from the ramp of you know slow build up to now the highway on the road to WrestleMania. And it's full speed ahead, you guys. It's got to make a little pit stop at Fast Lane, but after that, full speed ahead. It's going to be absolutely crazy. And let's actually talk a bit about Fast Lane before going into the uh, commercial. Basically. What is going on fast lane is that they've only got, God, they only have uh, four matches announced for fast lane. I kid you not. We are only about eight days away from fast lane, and you only got four matches on here. We have Asuka defending the SmackDown Women's Title against Mandy Rose. Uh, Mandy got that victory last week by defeating uh, Asuka in a non-title matchup. So this is kind of her payoff. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, I get it. They're using the whole, you know, you have to earn your opportunity. Mandy earned it, so I can't really complain about that. Uh, the Boston Hug Connection, Bailey and Sasha Banks, will be taken on Nia Jax and Tamina for the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships. Uh, Bailey and Sasha actually made an appearance on NXT this past week, which was kind of nice to see. Uh, and also, Bailey just barely defeated. Uh, Nia Jax in their matchup on Raw, which I've said before, I was kind of shocked by that. I would have figured that they would have gone with uh, Nia to kind of build their momentum up, but I guess that wasn't the case. I think that this upcoming week we'll see Sasha Banks versus Tamina, and then Tamina's going to kind of tie it off. I think that's how it's going to be. Uh, the SmackDown Live Tag Team title matchup, the Usos taking on Shane and Miz. I'm not really looking forward to that matchup. Uh, it's it, This... 
mm, why is this a thing? And then we have uh, Daniel Bryan defending the WWE title against Kevin Owens. So Fastlane looks to be a bit of an interesting night. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the event of the year, but I think it's going to be a very interesting night on the road to WrestleMania. So with that being said, guys, I will be taking a quick commercial break, and then when I come back, I will talk about some of the other uh, things that have been going on in the world of wrestling, and also going to be answering some questions that were posted up from me from Twitter as well as on Facebook. But before we get into that, guys, go check out AJsBelts.com. They have some of the best selections of championship belts, replicas, as well as just an absolute array of Great merchandise, wrestling related. Go check them out. AJsBelts.com. Proud sponsors of the Game Changer and Pro Talk Wrestling. Check out the guys over at Eclectic Media Project. They bring you podcasts such as Musically Challenged. Whose podcast is it anyway? Want to hear something interesting? And their newest podcast, page 3.14 News. Check them out on Podbean and iTunes at Eclectic Media Project. On their website at www.eclecticmediaproject.com. Check them out as they are the home with a little something for almost everyone. Hey guys, welcome back to Pro Talk Wrestling, a part of the Game Changing Network. Of course, you guys, I'm Nate the Effing Great, and I'm here to talk more about professional wrestling throughout the week. Let's just continue right on into it, talking a little bit more about WWE, and then I'm actually going to get into some impact news, uh, as well as a couple of new matches that were added on for the Double or Nothing show uh, this upcoming week. Uh, not this upcoming week, uh, in just a couple months, I should say. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about it. Uh, this past week on NXT, they announced that the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic Tournament will be making its return. And guys, one of the teams that will be a part of it will be Tashtag DIY. Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano apparently will be involved in the Tag Team Tournament this year, it's going to be very interesting to see the mindsets they have in here, as well as how well they're going to get along with this, because obviously they have different agendas going into this, and, oh man, I'm just very interested in seeing what it is, because you look at uh, the history, I think that we're at three, we're at three winners right now, we had uh, Samoa Joe and Finn Balor as the first winners, Then a year, and then uh, afterwards we had the Authors of Pain, then we had Undisputed Era, now we can add another person to the list. Uh, well, we don't know per se, I should say. Um, and from what my understanding is, I'm trying not to do too much in the way of spoilers. Uh, there's a reason why we saw Aleister Black and Ricochet doing a lot of tag team matches this past week. We ha saw them take on the Revival as well as uh, Nakamura and uh, Rusev. That's right. Uh, they are definitely teaming up for a reason, and I can understand a little bit as to why uh, we're seeing more of them in tag team matches than singles matches. And I think it is to promote the Dusty Rhodes Classic. So it's going to be very interesting to see what they got here, guys. Eight teams will be announced within the next few weeks, I would think. Yeah, they should be announced within the next few weeks. Uh, more than likely, it's going to be a deal in which it culminates either at TakeOver or possibly maybe the NXT before TakeOver. Because NXT TakeOver uh, New York is going to be where... Uh, I think it's going to happen at, at New York, now that I think about it. Uh, and for, you have to remember that whoever wins these tag team tit this uh, tag team tournament, usually they end up getting a tag team title shot. And by far... 
Every winner, with the exception of Samoa Joe and Finn Balor, has won the tag team titles. So this could be an omen of things to come. And honestly, guys, you have to believe that the War Raiders are going to be watching this tournament very closely because they could be facing their next competition. All right, next up, guys, we have the second inductee announced for the WWE Hall of Fame. It is the Honky Tonk Man. The Honky Tonk Man, for those of you that don't know, is the longest reigning intercontinental champion in WWE history. Definitely it looks like a kind of an Elvis Presley kind of superstar. Uh, and here's the interesting thing about this, is that uh, nowadays... He seems like, you know, he's excited to get going to the Hall of Fame. He seems very grateful. Uh, but there is an interview that surfaced about a few days ago, actually, that showed Honky Tonk Man talking badly about the Hall of Fame. Uh, he mentioned that it was a bunch of BS. Uh, he knocked on some of the people who went into the Hall of Fame. He didn't really believe it too much. Uh, but now, obviously, that was, you know, back then. This is now. Or if this was, like, a recent interview, that's a really weird bipolar change of hearts in, you know, for him. Uh, but then again, professional wrestling is the most bipolar thing I think I've ever seen. Um, one thing I will say that I think is BS when it comes to the Hall of Fame is that we don't have an actual physical Hall of Fame building to go to. I mean, WWE, what are you doing? Why can't you build this Hall of Fame? Why can't you build this building? I mean, look, think of it this way. You could do this in New York, or you could do it next door to the headquarters in Connecticut, or honestly, this is just me being a little biased, maybe go to like Chicago or Minneapolis or somewhere in the South. Obviously, you guys are doing that for your for your next WrestleMania. Jeez Louise. Uh, yeah, for those that are curious, the next event... Uh, next venue to host WrestleMania is going to be in Florida. I think it's either Tampa or Orlando. I can't remember which one it was, but I'm kind of I'm I'm pissed about it because I thought that for sure they were going to be going to Minneapolis, but no, they just decided no, we're going to stay in the South. We're going to stay in the New Orleans area. We're going to stay in you know the Florida area. It's like you, you've given these guys so many chances. What what is wrong with you? Why can't you just give? You know, somebody else a chance. I mean, honestly, I'd be okay with it going to California. Maybe they go to, like, Seattle, Washington again. Uh, but, yeah, when's the last time that the Midwest hosted WrestleMania? It was at least 10 years ago with WrestleMania 22. I, I just hope that they do something more with just WrestleMania than just putting it in the South. It makes absolutely no sense. And it will try, it, this will kind of tie in a little bit with uh, one of the questions that I have. Uh, given to me when I get into that. But before we get into that, still got to finish up a couple things. Uh, last thing I will talk about, uh, WWE related. I believe I talked about this on the last Pro Talk Wrestling, but if I haven't, then I'll bring this up again. Uh, Bruce Pritchard is back as a creative consultant, I believe, for the uh, WWE, for WWE. Uh, and his job effectively started this past Monday on Raw. So far, it worked out pretty good. I mean, Raw and SmackDown were pretty exciting to watch. So, if he was in charge of like the creative aspects for both these shows, spot on him for putting on a really good week of shows. Uh, but also, there's another rumor going around that Dana Warrior is probably going to be a consultant or be a part of the creative team somehow. And of course, there's a lot of people that are complaining like, oh, Dana Warrior, she's getting in because she was married to the Ultimate Warrior. Oh, Dana Warrior, she doesn't know anything about wrestling. Oh, Dana Warrior, no, no, we don't need this thing here. No, she's going to ruin everything and blah, 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 blah. It just, just shut up. I'm willing to give her a chance. I'm willing to give her the opportunity to, you know, give her mindset and give her ideas to the wrestling business because it's probably going to be a lot better than what we've seen in the last year. There are so many Raws that were so unbearable that I would love to see if, you know, something out of Dana's mind could be something that could be a major attraction. Honestly, if they want to, if they don't feel comfortable having her, you know, do like the main storylines, have her start with the women's division. I think that the women's division deserves their own creative team. Uh, 
but maybe a smaller one. Don't make it like 36 riders like you probably have at the men's. Make it like a very small batch with Dana Warrior heading that up. And I think that would actually be kind of cool. Especially now that they have, you know, the women's tag team titles. It would just be one of those things that I think they need a little more uh, realism. I think the only way that you can add realism is to have a woman basically say, hey, this is what a woman thinks. So I'm all for it. I honestly am. Uh, We had the announcement on Impact, going into Impact, some Impact news, that, uh, (coughs) excuse me, that um, Madison Rain is going to be making her return to Impact this upcoming week. Uh, She was actually a part of the Ring of Honor roster for a while, so I don't know if she got uh, let go early, because I think she had a contract signing from September 2018 to September of this year, if I'm not mistaken, but maybe she got released early. Maybe she found that she was much more comfortable with Impact. Who knows at this point? Uh, But the other big thing that came out of this, uh, and this is something I mentioned a while back, was Rosemary had to assemble a team to take on the James Mitchell team. And basically, if James Mitchell's team wins, they get Rosemary's soul, basically. If Rosemary's team wins, they get back. She gets back uh, Allie, or she likes to call her her bunny. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this goes. I still believe that this should be on pay-per-view, but that's just my opinion, subjectively. Uh, But during this whole deal, Rosemary's just trying to think, like, who would be great teammates for her. Uh, Kira Hogan and Jordan Grace, they come up to her basically saying that they want to be involved with this. And I love the altercation between uh, Rosemary and Kira Hogan. Basically, Rosemary is just saying, saying, you know, you don't want to be a part of this fight. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. This is not your battle. And Kira Hogan just stops her and she basically says, this is indeed my battle because Allie is my friend. She was the one who kind of introduced me to the business me to this. She's somebody who I really care about. And she's just showing this fire to Rosemary enough for Rosemary to say alright, fine, have it your way. <laughs> and I kind of like how, you know, she just has this reaction of just like I am going to regret so many things and this is probably one of them. Uh, I really am looking forward to this matchup now because you have you know, Rosemary who is the Demon Assassin. You have Kara Hogan, who definitely is going to be a future Knockouts champion. I guarantee it. And then you also have uh, Jordan Grace. It's Jordan Grace. She is legitimately one of those women that I look at and think, holy crap, she literally could just pop my head off, could she? Yep. Got it. Got it. (laughs) So, all right. I think that's going to do it for the wrestling news. So, guys, it's time to talk about some questions that were asked of me by people on Facebook as well as on Twitter. Thank you very much, you guys, for all the questions here. Uh, One person in particular is going to have a lot more questions on here, and it's not one of those things where I'm just saying, uh, you know, that I favored him more. It's just like, this is the guy who had a lot of questions, and that is, of course, Mr. Fretz. Mr. Fretz, shout out to you. Thank you so much for your support, and thank you for the questions. I really do appreciate it. Uh, But we're actually not starting with Mr. Fretz. We're actually starting with... uh, Will, from the Kings of the Rings podcast, he asked the question, what is your ideal city to host WrestleMania? So, obviously, as I have said before, I would really love it for it to come back to Chicago, to come to Minneapolis. I, I would even take Detroit's, uh, Detroit, I almost said Detroit City. Uh, but yeah, just have it come back to Detroit, like here. Uh, but I will say this, that I think one place that would be very ideal, even though it's a long distance for a lot of people, but I think they would still go regardless, I would love to see them go to England. I think that, especially now that they have uh, NXT UK, you need to promote that more, and a better way to do that than to have your biggest stage, your biggest event, WrestleMania, at, you know, I think it's a Wembley Stadium, if I'm not mistaken correctly, uh... But yeah, just a large stadium in the UK, let them do it. And honestly, I would really love to see the main event feature, uh, this is me personally, 
Um, I would love to see you know two UK guys main event WrestleMania. Uh, it could be maybe Pete Dunne. It could be Joe Coffey. It could be any of the guys up and down the roster. You could have a Iron Man match between Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne, and we would be okay with that. I would honestly watch that match up and down all around. So uh, my heart of hearts would love to say Chicago, Minneapolis, and uh, Detroit, to answer your question, Will. But, of course, kind of taking it in another direction, I would think that uh, England definitely deserves that uh, spot and deserves to host WrestleMania. Definitely go into a place that has not done it. All right, so now we get on to one of the first of many questions from Mr. Frett. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Yeah, this is not a wrestling-related question, but I'll still answer it yeah, anyway. Yes, it is a sandwich. It has the two buns. It's got the meat in the middle. It's a sandwich. Uh, another one coming from Mr. Fretz is, Who do you think wins Money in the Bank this year? Men and women. So, who do I think would be the best options, basically, for Money in the Bank? For this year. Uh, for me, this was something that I've been considering because there is a heavy rumor going around that they're going to be turning Bobby Roode heel within the future. Honestly, I would love to see Roode and Gable maybe be a great matchup for WrestleMania. Uh, I would probably have them on the pre-show. I know it's kind of mean for me to say because it is Bobby Roode and Chad Gable, but I don't think they're going to have that kind of uh, great, you know, uh, storyline telling to get it onto the main WrestleMania card. But if they get it on the pre-show, that would be totally okay with me. So, as far as the men's go, I would pick uh, Bobby Roode. As far as the women's matchup, this was a little bit tougher because I look at it up to up top to bottom, and I think to myself, you know, who kind of deserves this more? Uh one of the answers I could probably deliver is Lacey Evans would be a pretty good one to do. Uh, maybe Shayna Baszler, give them for that. Uh, but if I had to pick one, I would go with Sonya Deville. So I've been stating this for a while that Sonya Deville is a future women's champion just waiting to happen. And this was one of those moments where I think that she deserves it. She gets the briefcase. And maybe she's one of those women who actually cashes it in, not during a matchup, but she actually says, hey, I'm going to challenge you at this big event. Maybe she says she's going to challenge at, uh, maybe she does a swerve and she actually challenges them at Survivor Series. You know, after uh, the champion is beaten down by the Raw champion, they got their deals going on, Sonya comes out and she cashes in. So it's like, yeah, you may have won this victory for the brand or, oh, you lost this victory for the brand, let me show you how a real champion does it. Just be like that. I just really love the idea of Sonya Deville being women's champion. So I'm hoping that is going to be the case. So Sonya Deville all the way, as well as Bobby Roode all the way. Uh, another one from <laughs> Fretz. Who is your favorite face of Foley? Oh, Mankind. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. I love that he's unique. I love that he definitely just can be comedic, but he can also be a t sick, twisted, demented SOB. Uh, if you want like the best prime example of that, I would have anybody go back to his interview with JR. Uh, it is one of the best interviews that you will ever see. It is just absolutely wonderful, and it definitely does showcase the talent that Foley has to create a character, and also just the great storytelling that he can deliver. I mean, he's obviously, you know, he's obviously an author for a reason. So, yeah, mankind all the way. Now, this one is one that kind of ticks me off. Again, from Fretz, who should retire Kurt Angle, and why is it Sean Stasiak? Because it's Sean Stasiak, what more do I need to say? Moving on. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, as far as who I would have... Uh, retire Kurt Angle, I would want to be somebody who's going to take this victory over Angle and definitely help motivate him to be just as good as Angle, if not better. The only person that comes to mind that I could see doing that is Chad Gable. And I would really love to see that. I would love to see Gable 
uh, beat Kurt Angle uh, after maybe some build up. We have Kurt Angle and him maybe doing like a little deal where it's like a mentor and a coach deal, uh, mentor and student kind of kind of deal. And then finally, Kurt Angle basically, you know, maybe he turns on Gable. I think that'd be the best thing to keep Gable as a big time babyface. And at the end of the matchup, Gable gets the victory over Kurt, out wrestles him. Kurt Angle sticks out his hand, and he's basically indicating, you know, yep, you're the future. You're definitely somebody that. Uh, people are definitely going to want to see within the next few years be the best. Uh, I, I remember uh, Simon Grimm, uh, Simon Gotch, for a lot of people that are WWE fans, uh, he actually said that uh, Gable is hilariously uh, gifted and very talented in the ring. And he actually said uh, about a week, maybe a little while after getting to know Gable, he says, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame someday. And I really want that to happen. I think Gable would be a really good person to get into the Hall of Fame. And I think he really could do that if they utilize him very well. Because he's a very, he is so talented. You look at his matches from NXT, you look at his matches that he has even on the main roster, he definitely is one of those very underrated talents that definitely deserves a lot more than what he's given. So to answer the main question, who should retire Kurt, in my opinion, it should be Gable. Uh... Ace Patrick Spade, uh, Patrick, actually somebody I know from my training and in independent days, uh, he asked the question, do you know of anyone that would want to invest in an indie promotion? So I would definitely be more than willing to invest in an indie promotion. I will say this, I'm going to do a cheap plug for these two guys, because let me rephrase the question a little bit. If there is an indie promotion here in Wisconsin that I would like to uh, invest in, which one would they be? The top two that come to my mind are ACW, uh, Wisconsin, and Frontline Pro. Uh, ACW, Wisconsin is headed up by uh, Josh Weimer, who I've had on the show, as well as Dylan. A lot of people might know him as Swoggle. Uh, they have been putting on some really fantastic shows, and they are one of the best Wisconsin-based uh, professional wrestling uh, organizations I have ever seen. A lot of the great matches, a lot of the great stars come from ACW, and they have just done a great job. And I will tell you this, that if you want to get a feeling of the amount of appreciation that you feel from going to these shows, uh, Josh Weimer is one of those guys that I see, and I've had the opportunity to talk to him you know, face-to-face. Uh, he's one of those guys who's come up to me, and he's always grateful that, you know, come out to the show. If he could, he would come up to every single person, shake their hand, give them a hug, just say, hey, thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you so much for supporting us. He definitely is one of those guys who really appreciates fans coming to the shows. Uh, so ACW Water City, up uh, ACW Wisconsin is one of those places that I would invest in. Uh, the other one is Frontline Pro, which is headed up by uh, Ben McCoy. Uh, this is a guy who definitely knows what it's like to uh, work for professional wrestling, to have a passion for professional wrestling, and to really create a great environment for professional wrestling. Of course, I've definitely been talking about this quite a bit, and I'll talk about it again, that for those of you that live in the Stevens Point area, definitely check out Frontline Pro. They're doing a show at the Holiday Inn for WrestleMania weekend that is going to be absolutely fantastic to watch. Some of you are probably thinking, like, well, I want to sit, maybe I'll sit home and watch the Hall of Fame. Uh, you can, otherwise you could just wait for it to come out on like a TiVo deal, watch it before WrestleMania. Uh, but go to this Frontline Pro event. It is definitely one of those things that I am fully endorse. I am fully, uh, sp- I am, we are one of the sponsors for the show, as well as for Water City WrestleCon, which again is happening on uh, April 27th. Definitely go check that out. Uh, as far as uh, Frontline Pro show, it's happening April 6th, I believe it is. It's the Saturday before WrestleMania. So definitely check those two out. They're going to be absolutely great. Uh, and unfortunately, I will not be able to make the Frontline Pro show. But you can expect me to do something really cool for Frontline Pro's uh, Facebook fan page while I'm in New York. So as far as it goes, guys, I definitely do say that ACW as well as Frontline Pro are just two absolutely wonderful companies that I would always invest in. There was a third one that I would have put in, but backstage politics as well as just bad uh, 
there's just a lot of bad, bad, bad juju, bad mojos behind this other promotion. I'm not even going to mention their name. They know who they are, and they almost made half the roster walk out. It was bad. Uh, next one is a from a local coming from uh, Mike Matters. Uh, he asked the question, do you think AEW will beat WWE in the ratings one day? I go to the go-to answer, which is yes, because uh, WCW thought that they were unstoppable for 80-some-odd weeks. I think it was like 82, 83 weeks in a row. Uh, and they thought that they couldn't be beaten. Then WWE finally beat them in the ratings the week after they had this deal where you know, Eric was thinking, like, he's so great to be the king of ratings and doing this whole deal and blah, 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 blah. You know, I think that uh, AEW is going to definitely have a product that WWE is not going to have. And that is, you know, whether it's young talent, whether it is great storylines, they're going to have something that WWE misses the ball with, misses the bar with. And it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out when uh, AEW gets, you know, get gets their TV deal going and they get their promotion going. It's going to be interesting to see that uh, slow rise for AEW because I think it's going to start at a pretty good, heavy, steady pace and then it's just going to build up and just explode. I think that even honestly, even if they go to like a Thursday, Wednesday show, they definitely will beat WWE in the ratings. And you have to also remember that with uh, SmackDown going to Fridays again, for Fox, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Uh, another one from Mr. Fretz. And he asked me, what's your favorite kind of ice cream? Whew, good question. I have not really narrowed this down. I'm more of a chocolate fan, but one of my favorites is chocolate chip cookie dough. Oh, gosh, that is just so good. Uh, he also asked, do you think Taker's streak should have ever ended? No. I know that I've talked about this before. I would have kept Undertaker's streak intact for such a long time, and I would have had him retire undefeated at WrestleMania. That's that's my opinion about it. And, gosh, I mean, Undertaker's 22, or is it 21? It's, I think, 22, 23, and 2, if I'm not mistaken. Uh and it doesn't look like he's going to be continuing that streak any further because of him being announced for, you know, double or nothing for, you know, the appearance. It doesn't look like he's going to be appearing at WrestleMania, which sucks, but what, what are you going to do? He obviously found something that was beneficial to him, so can't really blame him for it. Uh, Chad Knight, one of our co-hosts on the show, asked, what's the payoff to the current situation with Becky Lynch. I mentioned this when I talked a little bit earlier about the Becky Lynch and Ronda situation. I think right now Becky Lynch is still coming off as kind of like this conquering hero that's going to win the title from Ronda Rousey and she's going to uh, be the woman who you know carries this uh, company into the next generation. Right now I think the current payoff for this is that I think that Triple H and Stephanie go behind Vince's back and they, you know, release Becky Lynch. They're, it's obviously going to be one of those situations, like I've said, where uh, Becky is going to not really side with them, but they also realize that they're going to have to be on the same page to uh, beat Vince McMahon. So I think it's going to be one of those things where we see a bit of a different side of Becky Lynch, not really selling out to the authority, quote-unquote, but she's definitely going to be one of those people that, you know, will get along with them just until she gets her title shot at WrestleMania. And then after that, I could see her locking in the disarm her on uh, Stephanie just because, you yeah, know, I think a lot of us want to see that. Uh, final one comes from Mr. Fretz. Thank you again, guys, for all your questions, especially you, Mr. Fretz, for giving me all these questions. Holy crap. Uh he asks, how would you book a wrestling off-season, and when would you begin slash end? So I had a lot of time to think about this question. And here's how I'm going to compare it. So Lucha Underground is the perfect example of an off-season working as well as not working. So when they first started off, 
seemed like they had a really good plan. They had, you know, taped programming. They had the matches all ready to go. Boom, 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 boom. They have everything set up. Then they go on to Season 2, and then they went to Season 3. Then they went on to Season 4. So now here's the situation that is where it gets to be a negative. With all this off-season, obviously they're probably just, the wrestlers that are working there are probably, most of them are just going to be sitting at home not being able to do anything because they're locked into this exclusive contract. So it's one of those situations where, you know, it works because they have time off, they can wrestle wherever they want to, they can, you know, do this and that, not have to worry too much until the next season comes out. But if one of them gets, you know, hurt or something like that, then it kind of screws up a lot of their storylines that they probably had planned. So that's kind of where it comes off for that. Um, so for the off season, I'm going to put it in the frame of WWE. For WWE, they obviously have never really done an off season for, I would say even for years, actually. Uh, how I would do the off season, in my opinion, I would actually have the off season happen during December. I think December is one of the slowest times that they have ever had wrestling because a lot of people want to spend time, you know, doing shopping for Christmas gifts. They want to spend time with their family. They want to do, uh, you know, crazy deals at Walmart and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So that is probably the best time to do that. And honestly, people could say, well, you're saying that they shouldn't do WWE programming during that time. Au contraire. During that time, they could actually just uh, experiment with a couple other things. Like back when I started watching in 2004, I remember they did a Raw and a SmackDown where they kind of just looked back at, you know, great moments as well as not so great moments from the year. I think that this would actually give them a really good chance to do that. And maybe even during this time, they don't have to just do wrestling things. They can work on, you know, creative content or original content for uh, for the WWE Network. Like, think about it. You could take that entire month to do a 365 on maybe uh, on maybe Becky Lynch. That would be a, that'd be a good one. I think a lot of people would be really cool to see that. Uh, maybe they can do another, you know, sto- they could do like a couple stories. Angle deals. They could do more Edge and Christian show that totally reeks of awesomeness, incorporating more stars involved in there. Uh, maybe more of the like the round table deals or table for three. There we go. Um, have more shows where they could actually bring these out and they could sporadically put them throughout the year of 2000 and, uh, and whatever, the following year. And, you know, they can do that again for the following December. And if they wanted to bring out some old classics, Bring back the slammies. Bring back some of these things where they say, hey, this, I maybe even have a deal where it's like, you know, these are the matches that were voted on by you, the WWE fans. Just have like a poll go up where they basically state like, oh, hey, this matchup is here. This matchup is here. Uh, they could do like a three-hour show where they have, you know, six matches, six of their best matches, quote-unquote, and throughout that whole entire deal, they announce, you know, who won this, who won that. So maybe even they can have like a deal where they announce, you know, the WWE fans voted this person as the superstar of the year or the women's wrestler of the year, the event of the year, and, you know, stuff like that. Just experiment. Have fun with it while letting some of the people that are, you know, wrestlers spend time with their family, just stuff like that. And maybe a month is too much. Maybe I could do like two weeks. I think that'd be fair too. And to be fair, they could even do some things where they just have a deal where, you know, they upload something on YouTube where it's like Seth Rollins, you know, he gets to spend some time with family, but then he also trains a bit at the Performance Center. They could just say like, hey, you know, you have all this time off, feel free to use the Performance Center too. We would also just love to take some video footage of you, uh, you know, working out, getting ready. Uh, one idea that I thought was kind of uh, cool is maybe they could even toe back a bit with the um, uh, what is it with so, with some of these you know crazy ideas uh, <laughs> that um that they did like the, like the uh, mix max challenge they had 
the winner uh, enter in as number 30. Maybe they could do something like that, like a mini tournament, but the winner gets to choose when they enter in. Maybe the person just says, well, maybe I want to enter in at, uh, <clears throat> ow, gosh, I scratched my nose, um, have basically them come, you know, have them do like a mini tournament during the deal. Just say, hey, we want to do this deal in which, you know, we want to determine who will get to enter in whenever they want to. I think that'd be a cool concept. Uh, I actually do have one more question here that was just posted right now uh, from Kyle Moser. Uh, one of the guys from the uh, game chain from the game changer who asked the question: What is the purpose of having Lacey Evans walk out and then go back? Right now, she's kind of the epitome of. I think she's almost like the response from what Scarlett Bordeaux does in Impact Wrestling. That's just my opinion, uh, but I think it's one of those things where you know. She's just kind of showing that she's classy. She's showing herself off. Kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, you can look but you can't touch kind of deals. I think that it's kind of smart because it kind of makes you think, okay, well, she's good at doing this. Now, what could she be like in the ring? So it's kind of like, I think, what they were doing with Eva Marie for a while, uh, but done way better because Lacey Evans is very talented and very good in the ring. So I think that's my response to that. So thank you guys so much for all the questions. Thank you so much for listening in. I will be heading off. So thank you so much. Be sure to give us a like on our Facebook fan pages. Be sure to give us, give me a follow on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube and guys enjoy another week of wrestling. We are just about eight days away from Vaseline. That's going to be awesome. Uh, WrestleMania is just around the corner as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, Frontline Pro is going to be hosting a show in Stevens Point. ACW Water City WrestleCon will be at the end of April. And, guys, I'm actually going to be doing an interview with uh, Ben McCoy within the next couple of weeks. So definitely tune into that where we hype up a bit of Frontline Pro as well as talk about his movie that is going to be in the works as well as happening Definitely tune into that, you guys. So this has been Nate the F and Great. This has been the Game Changer. This has been Pro Talk Wrestling. I will talk to you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye. Avengers, head out.